Uh, my name is Specialist Fourth Class Nelson Kuhn. I was with Charlie Battery, 1st and 92nd Field Artillery. And uh, where were, were you? Where were you based in Vietnam? Our base was in Pleiku, but LZ Kate was down by Bambi to it. Okay, and let's let's back up a little bit. Tell me uh, how you how you came to uh, be in the military and, and get into Vietnam. Okay, I joined the military when I was 17 years old. My father was in World War II as an infantryman. And he didn't want me to be in the infantry in Vietnam, so he decided to sign the papers for me if I'd get in some kind of training that wouldn't send me to Vietnam. So my buddy and I joined the service together, and I signed up for Honest John Rockets, and he volunteered for the draft because he didn't want to spend much time in the military. When we left basic training, I got infantry, and he got Honest John Rockets. So I went to infantry school, and I was supposed to go to Vietnam as an infantryman, but my father came to my basic training graduation and talked to my brigade commander who served in World War II with my father. And my dad said he didn't want anything to do with me being in the infantry in Vietnam. World War II veterans didn't believe in Vietnam, I guess. So I went to, uh, my, the colonel told me to go ahead and go to infantry school and he'd send orders forward and get me out of the infantry back to Honest John Rockets. I preferred the infantry, so I went to the infantry, something like the eighth week or seventh week of my infantry school. My company commander said, I got orders for you to go to Honest John Rockets school. I said, I don't want to go, so he said, okay. He would waiver them and I could stay in the infantry. I went home on leave in December of 68, supposed to go to Vietnam January 1st as the infantryman, but I got a call from the Department of the Army telling me I had to go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. They canceled my orders. My father was happy, I wasn't. <laughs> And I was 18 years old then, so I figured I didn't have to worry about what my dad thought anymore. So I got to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I went through Honest John rocket training, and about two weeks into the training, they canceled it because they didn't have enough people to go through it. So they sent me to FADAC Computer School and Fire Direction Control School. After that, they said, everybody's going to Vietnam that went through this training. Of course, I didn't. They sent me to Germany. I didn't like Germany, so I went to volunteer for Vietnam. And they said the only way I could go to Vietnam would be to go as an artilleryman, which I knew nothing about. They said, well, you'll have on-the-job training in Vietnam. So when I got to Vietnam, they put me in a 155 howitzer unit, the towed howitzer. I'd never seen one before. Didn't particularly want to be there. I preferred the M16 or M60 machine gun over that big howitzer. So I was only in three Vietnam three weeks when I was on LZ Kate and the fighting started there. And, and you wanted to go to Vietnam, is that right? Yes, I did. I wanted to go as an infantryman, but the only way I could get there was to go in the artillery. I asked them in Germany if I could sign up for an infantry unit. They said, no, you're artillery now. We don't like trading with the infantry, so you're going to stay artillery. So the only way I could get there was to stay with the artillery. And wh why did you want to go to Vietnam? I don't know. My father was in World War II as a veteran, and you know, you grow up with shows like Combat on TV and you, you play a soldier when you're a little kid. So people could tell me all they wanted about Vietnam, but I figured I had to go for myself and find out what it was like. And how, did you express that to, you know, throughout your training, like at Fort Sill and when you arrived in Germany? Uh, did you express that to the command there that you wanted to go to Vietnam? Yeah, when I was at Fort Sill, 
I didn't really care about the MOS as training me in. I wasn't doing real well in my classes. So the commander called me in and talked to me to kind of pump me up. And I said, why don't you just send me back to the infantry and send me to Vietnam? He says, no, we're not going to send you to the infantry. You're artillery now. But I kept telling people I wanted to go to Vietnam. And then one buddy of mine in Germany, he re-enlisted for Vietnam. And I thought, oh, you can do that? So that's when I did it. There was something that I read in uh, in the book, and I don't know where this was in all that uh, training and that, that somebody had said, uh, almost threatened, I'd just send you to Vietnam, and you told them that was fine, or how, how did, do you remember how that went, or? Well, they always tried to make that threat in the military. If you weren't going to Vietnam, they thought if you screwed up or did something wrong, they'd threaten you with, We'll send you to Vietnam. I thought, that's fine, go ahead. <laughs> but they wouldn't do it so until I re-enlisted. Okay. So, I just want to check one thing here. I can't see all my controls from, oh. from sitting here, so every now and then I just want to make sure everything's going good. Yeah, it's looking fine. All right. So, all right. And it, uh, so you went to Vietnam and you were... Did it say you were 13 Bravo? I was 13 Bravo when I re-enlisted in Germany. My MOS was 11 Bravo. And then they sent me, like I said, to that rocket school, and they canceled that. And then they sent me to FDC, which uh, I believe I was a 13 Echo MOS. And they said, well, you're going to go to Vietnam. But then I didn't. They sent me and two other guys to Snow Hall at Fort Sill to FADAC Computer School with the Marine Corps. We were three Army guys with Marines. And then they said, everybody's going to Vietnam, except three of us. We all got sent to Germany. Yeah, okay. And then they stuck me in a Honest John rocket unit in Germany, which I never trained on, because they canceled the class. Typical military. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the Honest John rockets, what, what were those? Uh, it's a rocket that sits on a, like a two and a half or five ton truck. I can't remember which. And they could use them in combat, I guess. They had Honest John rocket units in Vietnam, but I don't think they ever used an Honest John rocket in combat in Vietnam anyway. Okay. So the, and they were long range, right? Oh, yes. Okay. So tell me, um, so they, they discontinue that or they took you out of that and then you go into Vietnam to, to man a, a howitzer? 155 toad howitzer, they call them a pig. They have self-propelled 155s, but we were airlifted everywhere. We were kind of an air mobile unit. Anywhere they needed artillery, they could drop us into a hilltop just like LZ Kate. And what's, what's, tell me, what, what did you do? I mean, is how many, how many men man a howitzer like that? What's your role and what's, uh, I know there was something mentioned in the book to where this is how they trained you to do it at Fort Sill. And then this is how it really happens in the field. Right. I'm not sure really, like I never trained on a howitzer at Fort Sill, so I'm not really sure how many men are actually assigned to a gun. But I suppose there's probably five or six of us that are assigned to the gun. And you got the gunner and you have the assistant gunner. Then you have people that help load the round into the gun. I was called what's like a rammer. I was left-handed and most guys are right-handed. So when they put the projectile in the tube, we had a long ramrod that we'd ram the round in so it would seat into the breech. So they had me doing ramming since I didn't do much of anything else. And then... Uh, like I said, when Kate started, the first day that we got hit, or the first morning, Captain Albrecht sent out a unit at night on a patrol, and they said it was Buku VC. So the next morning, I was in a hooch sleeping, and I heard explosions going off. I thought it was my gun, and I thought, well, if it's a howitzer I'm assigned to, why am I not woken up to go to the gun? And then a guy was screaming for a medic, so I knew it had to be incoming. Right. And was how, uh, at that point, how long had you been in Vietnam? 
I arrived in Vietnam the 8th of October of 69. I believe I got to, well, that started about the 27th of October, so less than three weeks I was in country. And was that, what you just described, was that the first time you had experienced incoming? Yes, because uh, when I first arrived, I arrived in uh, Cameron Bay. I had to process in, then I was sent to Play Coup, which is first and 92nd headquarters where I was assigned. And then we waited for some more new guys to come in, and they all flew to Bambi to it with me. And then we waited for a chopper to take us out to Kate, so never really saw any incoming until then. So tell me then what what happens, at, you know, you were awoken by the fire, you realize that it's incoming, then that's the beginning of what turns out to be a four or five day siege. Right. And so what uh, what happens, you know, the, at that point on that day when you start taking incoming? Well, I was in the hooch, like I said, sleeping, and there was another new guy that was in the same hooch with me. He was a Buck Sergeant E-5, Sergeant McFarland. We heard a guy screaming for a medic, so Sergeant McFarland looked at me and says, go get that guy and drag him in here. I said, why don't you go get him and drag him in here? So we both went out and got the guy, and the guy was screaming that he lost his legs and stuff, but he didn't have a scratch on him. I think it was psychological because when the incoming started, a round came into his hooch, and he sat up, and the round, I think, went right through the hooch, and he just psychologically thought it blew his legs off, but he didn't have a scratch on him. And the gun that I was assigned to, it was destroyed. We couldn't fire it because the enemy had hit it with some rounds. So all of a sudden, I was infantry again. Any idea who that? Uh... I can't recall who he was, but they dusted him off anyway because in his mind, he was messed up. So that first morning, they sent him to the rear. So uh, how many, you were initially on the howitzer, now that's taken out. How many howitzers were on Kate? There were two 155 howitzers and there was one 105 howitzer. The 105 crew, they weren't with Charlie Better, they were with another unit. But since they knocked out my gun, then all of us kind of helped on the last gun we had, the last 155. They were going to airlift the one of mine that was disabled but we could never get it out because the enemy kept incoming any chopper that would try to get it out. And are those just, you know, I'm not military, a lot of our audience won't be. What's the difference between a 155 and 105? Are they similar or is one bigger than the other? 105 is smaller than a 155. A 155 round is like 106 pounds. That's the round itself and then you put a powder bag in behind it. It depends on how far you're going to shoot the round depends what charge or powder you put in it. 105 was smaller and it had canisters. Once you fired a 155, there was nothing left. The round was gone, the powder bags were gone. You had to open the breech and swab the tube to clean it out before you put another round in. A 105, it had a shell, a brass shell, and it had a round in it. Once you fired that round, the shell would come back out. So it was a lot different. Plus, they had beehive rounds, which they could fire. They had tiny flechettes in them, like little darts, and they could fire a charging enemy. And it really did a job on the enemy. And that was out of the 155? 105. Oh, 105. Okay. All right. And the 105, which was on one part of the hill, the, the wheel was knocked off of it from an enemy round that came in. I don't know if it was a B 40 rocket or what but it blew the wheel off the howitzer, but they were still able to fire it. Those guys on that gun really did a great job. So you're, you're back as an infantryman at this point. Well, like I said, I helped out with the other gun, but they had their own crew. So I grabbed an M60 machine gun, plus I had my M16. And I'd just go around the perimeter wherever I felt I was needed with the M60. And then uh, I was on the perimeter with the mountain yard forces. They were trained by the special forces. They were mountain yard 
tribesmen that lived in the mountains of Central Highlands. And uh, I took the M60 down there, and there was one assault where some enemy were coming at us. And I don't know, you get scared in combat, but I was just focusing on firing at the enemy. And there was one soldier in particular, an enemy soldier, to come charging toward our position. And I fired M60 rounds into him, a 30 caliber round. He seemed to keep coming and finally he dropped not too far from me. And I looked at the mountain yards that were sitting there with me and they were kind of smiling at me. And I thought, well, I guess I asked for Vietnam. Here it is. <laughs> so. And was that, uh, did you have a lot of encounters like that where you, you know, I mean, you could see the enemy charging? And... Yeah, you could see the enemy at times, but a lot of times they were just firing mortars and rockets at us. At one time, I had to, I had to relieve myself, and I stood up, and three mortars come crashing in when I was standing there, and I just kind of looking around like, an out-of-body experience saying, wow, this is unreal. And then the medic threw me down on the ground. So what are you trying to do, get killed? I said, no, I'm trying to take a leak. <laughs> but uh, then I went down by the 105 crew and we, well, I was watching them for a while and there was some enemy coming down the slope and they fired around and I saw one enemy soldier, he must have flown 50 feet in the air, but so I knew there wasn't anything left to him much. But we did see, you know, it depends. I think in combat, it depends on the individual person. Everybody sees a battle different than some. Some people are busy with other things, contacting radios or contacting the rear. Captain Albrecht, I know he was calling in airstrikes and stuff with F-4 Phantoms, there was helicopter gunships around. I mean, it was really busy at times. Sometimes it'd be nothing. But you'd sit there at night and you could hear the enemy cutting trees down. And you'd think, well, they plan on being here a while. So it, it was a different experience for an 18-year-old. I can imagine. And what, um, so you mentioned at, at night, when, when was, most of this fighting, was it during the day? Was it at night or? It seemed to be mostly during the day. At night it wasn't too much, but you're always worried about sappers crawling into the wire or something or the enemy coming in at night. But yeah, like I said, you'd sit there and you could hear them building bunkers or fortifications or whatever, and it was pretty creepy. But we had Puff the Magic Dragon and Spooky flying overhead at night. So that kind of kept their heads down. Now, I'm familiar with Spooky. What's Puff the Magic Dragon? I believe it's sort of the same thing. Okay. C-130 or whatever they use with mini guns. Okay. And they'd fire, and every fifth round was a tracer. And all you'd see is you'd look up, and you'd just see one straight red line coming down. Right. So you knew there was a lot of firepower being put out. Tell me, tell me about Captain Albrecht and, uh, and his role you know, as this siege started and, and what he what he did? Well, I, you know, I wasn't in the CP bunker that much, but uh, the rumor that I heard was the captain that was there, the Special Forces captain that was there when I first got there, he wasn't sending out patrols or doing much. He was throwing knives and playing cards with the Mountain Yard soldiers. And... The, the story I heard, it may be wrong, but I heard he was relieved. I've heard later that he just went on R&R &R and Captain Albrecht replaced him. But uh, Captain Albrecht, to me, I mean, I'm an 18-year-old kid there. I think Captain Albrecht was 21. But here's a Green Beret captain, and I thought, man, this guy's something else. A round would go off or something, a lot of us would flinch or maybe hit the dirt, and he'd just sit there directing fire or whatever. And I said to him once, I said, sir, doesn't that bother you when we're getting hit like that? He said, Green Berets are trained not to worry about stuff like that. And to me, he was just a man among men. He was a great leader. So that had to be reassuring to, you know, a lot of the men to see that from a leader. Right. 
But then he got wounded from some shrapnel in the arm or something, and we were all kind of worried that they were going to take him and dust him off and take him to the rear, but he refused to leave. So we were all glad of that. So how did... How does the fighting escalate, or what happens as we go through these two, three days uh, before the E&E? Well, it kept getting worse all the time. We had a lot of gunships and Cobra, gun, uh, Cobra helicopters around us. We had military, I mean, Air, Air Force jets come in and stuff. You could see the pilots sitting in the jets when they had dropped the bombs. They dropped napalm, and you could feel the heat coming off of it. And uh, you'd see them dropping HE rounds, bombs out of their jets, and you could see the t tail fins on the bombs and everything. I mean, there's another thing. To me, as an 18-year-old, I was kind of really impressed at all the firepower that was going on there with the helicopter gunships and all that. And then, uh, like you said, you asked, it kept increasing all the time. We kept getting more and more incoming and stuff and then uh, I was laying on the side of the hill with two buddies of mine and uh, the one helicopter come in and it took around in the tail boom and was on fire and we saw it going down and we it was like slow motion to me I was saying pull the thing up pull it up but it crashed in the jungle and I guess all of them were killed all the pilot and the crew but once that happened, the sky was clear. There wasn't any more helicopters, no more gunships or nothing. It's like, well, we're on our own now. They didn't want to get shot down, so all of a sudden they were gone. But they came back eventually. So the, with it being so heavy as far as uh, fire on the ships, uh, you were you getting supplies or reinforcements or once in a while we'd get a helicopter that would come in to pick people up or something and they would I remember one time they kicked off a 50 caliber machine gun that they got from the rear but it never got set up nobody could set the headspace and timing on it but I wish I had remember known what I know now because I know how to set the headspace and timing now oh. <laughs> Of course, a machine gun, a 30 caliber, a 50 caliber, the enemy's going to try to knock that out because that means big trouble for them. That's why after I shot that one enemy, I just left the M60 there with the mountain yard because I had my M16. An M60 will bring trouble on yourself too at close quarters because the enemy wants to knock that out. Not that I was worried about that at the time, but... The, Mountain Yards wanted to use the M60, so I left it with them. And what's what's an M60? I'm familiar with the M16. An M60 is an air-cooled 30 caliber machine gun. It's belt-fed. It's like, I think it's about 23 pounds it weighs. Okay, so that's a lot to lug around. Yes. Um, you had mentioned the one helicopter went down. Um, other than that, you know, men on the ground, were you taking a lot of casualties? No, we weren't taking many casualties. There were a few guys wounded, shrapnel here and there. I was in a hooch one time, and I was sitting on a cot, and a Sergeant Codwell was sitting in the middle, and I think it was Bernie Trani, a friend of mine, sitting on the other side. All of a sudden, a mortar hit, and it was right close to the entrance to the hooch, and once the dust cleared, we checked each other out. Bernie Trani and I, sitting on either end, weren't injured, but... Sergeant Codwell in the middle was bleeding. He had caught shrapnel in the face and stuff in the arms, and they evacuated him. And the first day, I think, they evacuated a, a black guy. His name was Rudy. I can't remember his last name. But here and there, they'd evacuate guys that got wounded. As, as this went on, um, and, and you're losing, your guns are, are being disabled, and... Uh, is there a sense that, you know, the reinforcements aren't coming, we're not going to make it out of here? What, what was the general state of mind, I guess? Well, I think Captain Albrecht was <clears throat> talk, communicating with his higher-ups, trying to get us to get evacuated off the hill or leave the hill with an escaping evasion, but I think he was denied for a while. Finally, when it got pretty bad, 
when all the our other gun was knocked out down around, hit the tube, and I think there was a crack or something in the tube. So Captain Albrecht finally decided we're going to evacuate this hill because they're going to overrun us pretty soon if we don't. So tell me, what was the when when that order was uh, approved or you know he decided hey we're we're leaving what what was the plan Do you, were you aware of the plan at that point no like i said i was i was all over the hill i didn't want to stay in a bunker because i figured if the enemy comes i'm not going to be stuck here in a bunker and have them come in and kill me if i'm going to die i'm going to die out there on the hill so uh the word finally came down that we were going to evacuate and we were all supposed to destroy the tubes on the guns that were destroyed anyway. So we threw incinerary grenades down the tubes. We are supposed to destroy any personal stuff that we couldn't take with us. And uh, we were supposed to meet on the hill at a certain time over by the CP at dark and evacuate. And in the distance, <coughs> excuse me, in the distance we saw, I think it was like 16 Huey helicopters. So this one, Guy says, oh, they're coming in here to get us out. But that wasn't the plan. There was a Mike Strike Force that was going to meet up with us so far off of Kate once we linked up with them. And what's a Mike Strike Force? Mike Strike Force is a unit trained by Special Forces. They're mountain yard troops, mostly SIDS, they call them, Civilian Irregular Defense Group. The Special Forces train them to fight the enemy, so there's a Mike Strike Force going to link up with us. And as I understand it, <clears throat> they couldn't get close to Kate even if they wanted to because of the, the amount of fire they would take, or so that probably led to... Yeah, I don't think... We were surrounded by the enemy, so I, I, it was even going to be risky to link up with them a couple of clicks away. And so what... Uh, you met up on the hill... To, to start this escape, and what is this middle of the night, or when did this all happen? It wasn't too long after dark. We all met at the CP, and as we were going over there, I was on the far end of the LZ, so I went over to the link up with the rest of the guys, and there was some fire from one side of the hill. So Captain Albrecht said, you guys wait here, I'm going to go check out what that is. He said, if I'm not back in five minutes, you guys head out without me. Well, we all decided if he didn't come back, we weren't going anywhere. If he didn't come back, we were going to stay there and fight it out. But fortunately, he came back. Okay. So then uh, walk, walk me through that, uh, the escape and evasion. You know, uh, how long does that take? What kind of things were you up against? Well... Like I said again, I didn't know the whole scenario because I wasn't in the CP. I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea till later how many enemy soldiers were surrounding us. And uh, then I heard a rumor that uh, some of the Mike Strike people, I mean the mountain yards that were with us, they were wounded pretty bad. And I heard a rumor that their commander, if they weren't able to walk off that hill, he went around and shot them because they weren't going to be a burden to him to try to carry them off in litters. So uh, when we got ready to leave the hill, I remember there was one Mike Strike soldier. He was kind of limping. So I went over and put my arm around him, kind of helping him to leave the hill. Then all of a sudden, one of our trip players went off on the perimeter and lit up the whole place. So we all hit the ground, and when that flare went out, People started going through the, our own perimeter, leaving. And I don't know what happened to that Mike Strike soldier, but I saw him the next day, so he was all right. But we got off. Captain Albrecht told us before we left. He said, when we leave, if the enemy starts firing on us, don't fire back right away because they might not know where we're at. They might just be reconning by fire to get us to fire at them so they could find out our positions. So we got off the hill, and uh, a Tricom, I think it was a 51 caliber Tricom machine gun started shooting at us. It was up on a hill higher than us, but I don't think they could get the muzzle low enough to hit us because the tracers were flying over our head. And uh, this one staff sergeant that was 
temporarily on Kate. He laid his M16 across my forearm and started firing back at the machine gun. Finally, somebody told him to cease fire. Uh, I didn't appreciate that very much. I can imagine. <clears throat> but a lot of the mountain yards, they were leading us off there with Captain Albrecht. I think he wanted to go one way and they decided they wanted to go another, so he figured they knew the terrain and the area better than he did. So we followed them into the woods. I mean, it was the jungle was pitch dark. You couldn't see anything, tripping over things. Guys were yelling out. They were Americans, or so we could all link up and try to find where everybody was. I guess we lost one soldier on the way there. There's rumor that he went back to get something and never came back. We don't know whatever happened to him. So this is, and so how many guys are we talking about? Is this like a, a group of 100 people trying to make their way through a dark forest? or? Well, there wasn't uh, that many Americans. I, I'm not sure the count of Americans, but it was just the 105 crew and the ones of us that were on the 155 and then the people that were in the command, the command bunker. So how were you able to stay together in the pitch dark? Well... Captain Albrecht and Sergeant Pirelli, who was a Special Forces E-5, they all kind of got us together in line and everything once we got into the jungle and linked up with everybody. Somehow somebody got lost, though. They lost a guy in front of them, so the next morning when daybreak hit, there was me and probably four or five other guys out there on our own. We didn't know where the rest of the unit was. So uh, this one guy, he said, to this new guy, you got us lost. You didn't follow the guy in front of you, so you're going to walk point. But the next thing we know, one of our guys linked up with us, and we got back with the main unit. And was, I guess, what's what's your mood during all this? I mean, was there ever panic, like when you realize the four of you are kind of separated, or is it is there too much going on to even think about that? Well, we hadn't slept in a few days. I looked at one guy and I, I thought, holy crap, that guy looks like crap. I wonder if I look like that. But uh, i back up a little. When we were going through the jungle at night, Captain Albrecht was leading and he was going to link up with that mic strike force. Well, I guess he crawled through the jungle to make communications with the mic strike and we kind of held up until he came back. And then nobody told me we were coming into friendly lines. So here it is in the middle of the night, and I'm walking along with my M16, and I fall into this foxhole. First thing I think is it's a punji pit, but I look to my left, and there's a mountain yard, and on my right was a mountain yard, but I didn't know. I thought maybe they were NVA. So the stupidest thing I could think of, I looked at them and said, are you guys friendly? And they both smiled and laughed, so I thought, all right, we're with friendlies now. I don't know what I'd have done if I'd have said, no, we're not, or started firing, but that was an experience, too. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so at that at that point, how long had you been? It was just an overnight, like a few hours, or how long had you been in the jungle until you met up with them? Well, we left, like I said, I think it was just after dark. We left Kate, but we were still on the move when daybreak came. And then we marched into Boo Prang, a special forces camp. I don't know, it must have been late morning or afternoon by the time we got in there. And at that point, it had been days since you'd slept. Yes. And then so was was the fighting over when you reached Boo Prang? Was that a point of, you know, we've made it? Or was, uh, was there also fighting going on at Boo Prang at that time? There wasn't do, no fighting at Boo Prang at the time, but I guess later... Boo Prang, I don't know if it got overrun, or, but I know Boo Prang was hit pretty hard after Kate, but not too long after. Okay. But as we was walking off Kate, going into Boo Prang, we saw Air Force jet just dropping all kinds of bombs on LZ Kate. They pretty much leveled the place. And did you ever experience anything like that again during your tour? Well, after uh, we went back to the rear and played cool, we got some 
got awarded decorations, and then uh, they sent us to a place called LZ Mike Smith that was named after Lieutenant Smith. And they said, well, you guys are going to take it easy now. The guns are already there. You're going to take over guns that are there. The guys that are there now are going somewhere else. So you guys can relax a while at Mike Smith. Well, I think we were at Mike Smith for like 60 days and got hit like 52 days out of the 60. Oh, jeez. But we just got harassment. We got rockets, 122 rockets and mortars and stuff. Seems like on a daily basis they had hit us. And tell me, because I'm going to speak to him later, who, who was Mike Smith? What was what was his role at Kate? He was uh, Lieutenant Mike Smith, and he was uh, kind of like a platoon leader because in uh, the artillery, you got so many guns in a battery. In the infantry, you got companies in the artillery have batteries. I think there was like eight guns to a battery, but we were two, so we were a platoon, and he was the leader of our platoon. Okay. And he got wounded the first morning, I think it was, or the first day, and they evacuated him, but he came back out. He didn't have to, but he came back out. And when we were leaving the hill and we were all disorganized in the jungle after that machine gun opened up on us, we would have to grab each other's backpacks or our Alice packs and hold on to each other so we wouldn't lose somebody. And I was holding on to Lieutenant Smith's backpack on our way out till we linked up with everybody. Okay. And you had mentioned just briefly that, um, that uh, there was awards, uh, medals, handed out for this. Did everybody receive a medal? Or? I'm not sure who all received medals, but I think everybody that was on Kate got medals. And as far as officers, I know that Lieutenant Smith got the Silver Star, which he deserved. And all the NCOs, which are non-commissioned officers, E5 and above, I believe they got the Bronze Star with the V device. And then us lower echelon, E4 and below, we got the Army Accommodation Medal with the V for Valor. Okay. Um, and how did, uh, you mentioned that you went to a base that was named after Mike Smith. How, how does something like that happen? How, how did it get named out? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, and I don't think Lieutenant Smith knows why it was named after him either. Okay. It just seems strange that uh, there's somebody in active duty there with a, a base named after them. Well, I think maybe somebody in our higher up in our battalion or division or whatever, I think, you know, Lieutenant Smith got awarded the Silver Star, and they probably thought, well, we'll name this LZ after him or this fire base. Okay. Um, throughout that entire campaign, though, that, that siege and the, the E&Es, any actions of any of the men stand out in your mind, um, you know, as far as leading you through the jungle or things like that? Um, events that maybe <clears throat> I didn't ask about or you didn't talk about that stick out in your mind that we didn't cover? Well, like I say, I didn't stay in the hooch after this fighting started. And a friend of mine, who you're going to see, I think, is uh, Kenneth Hopkins. He was didn't stay in the hooch. He didn't believe in staying inside either. He had an M79 grenade launcher. And he was going around firing his M79 and hit a few enemy positions and killed a few enemy with his M79. I think he was a pretty gutsy fellow. And all the guys that were on that 105 howitzer, those guys had brass balls. They just, I don't know. It was outstanding the way those guys stayed out there on that gun and fired it when the enemy was shooting right at their gun. And then there was a friend of mine, Bernie Tarani. He was outstanding and did a great job of going around like I say, when you're in a combat like that, you kind of know your little piece of it. You don't really know the whole scenario unless you're in charge of things. And Captain Albrecht, I mean, that guy's, we're just grateful that he was there with us. And that kind of got me when we were in Bambi to it, when we got to the rear, they uh, were going to have an awards ceremony. They gave the Silver Star to uh, Lieutenant Smith. And I saw Captain Albrecht, he had his green beret on, and I said, what'd you get for this? He said, I didn't get anything. They expect us in special forces. Oh. 
But then I did hear he was going to get the Silver Star, but he was bringing some wounded in from a place he had just been to, and the general that was giving him the Silver Star got tired of waiting and left, which is a bunch of crap, but that's the way the military goes. Right, so he missed out on yes. that award. Okay. So how did you, uh, how'd you end up your tour then? How much longer were you there? And I was there until October of 1970. I spent my whole tour there. We'd be in some skirmishes here and there, like at Docto, we'd get incoming and fire back at the enemy and different places throughout Vietnam and the Central Highlands. I was on that 155 till I left. And so when you, when you came home, uh, were you done with the military? Did you continue with it? No, when I came back, like I said, I re-enlisted in Germany to go to Vietnam. And then I was told, rumor again, when you leave Vietnam, you got to have a year of stateside duty. Just before I left Vietnam, I had orders again for Germany. So uh, when I got back to Fort Lewis, when I returned from Vietnam, it was like a process out station before I went on leave. There was a drill sergeant there, and he said the Army was short of drill sergeants and he was looking for volunteers, so I told him I'd like to volunteer, and he looked at my orders and said, sorry, you got orders for Germany, you can't. Said the only thing you can do is call the Department of the Army when you get home and see what they can do. So I called the Department of the Army, and they told me, stay at home, we'll send your orders to you, you'll go be a drill sergeant somewhere. So I sat at home for like 40 days, Finally, my dad said, you better call DA again and say, what's going on? So I called him and said, you still home? I said, I was told to stay here. They said, well, go to Fort Lewis and report in. So I became a drill sergeant until I got out in 1972. And then I joined the National Guard in 77, and I spent a total of about 17, 18 years in the military. Okay. And... Uh... So what did you do after you got out of the military? I did a lot of labor. I worked in a foundry for years, and I worked construction. But uh, just dodging and ends like that, kind of labor jobs. Right. Um, anything, I mean, that's that's basically what I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, anything that we didn't cover that you wish I had asked about or didn't know enough to ask about? or. No, it'll probably come to me later, but nothing that I can think of right now. Okay. How do you, when you, do you stay in contact with any of the guys that you served with? I've been in contact for a few years now with Dan Pirelli, the Special Forces Sergeant. Okay. But uh, like I said, I haven't seen Captain Albrecht since Vietnam, but I plan on maybe in a couple of weeks visiting there. When you look back on that time, you know, just being 18, I mean, it, they're... Obviously, you're in a life-threatening situation, but it had to have an element of excitement to it. I mean, what, when you look back on that, like, what, do, what do you think, I mean, as far as the experience as a whole? Well, if I had to do it all over again, I would. I mean, I thought it was a great experience. My own personal opinion, I think this country should still have the draft and let people get drafted for a couple of years. War or no war, peacetime, let them learn a little bit of respect and a little bit of responsibility. Let everybody serve. But I didn't, uh, I don't regret anything that went on there. Like I said, I was really kind of, being 18 years old, see all that firepower. And then I was at some other places in Vietnam where they were called quad 50s. It'd be 450 caliber machine guns mounted on the back of a truck. And they'd all fire at once. And I saw them firing. And then I'd see they had this track vehicle called a duster. It would shoot 40 millimeter guns, pom pom guns like. I was just amazed at a lot of the firepower. And like I say, when the airstrikes were called in and stuff, I saw B 52 strikes in the distance where you would see shock waves going through the jungle. And then the enemy would still be in there firing back once the B 52 stopped. Sure, they might have got a lot of concussions and stuff, but it was amazing how that war went. Mm -hmm. Do you, I know a lot of guys have mentioned uh, that, you know, Kate was kind of 
stuck in a political mess with Vietnamization. And I mean, did, I know a lot of the guys on the ground weren't aware of all that at the time. I mean, what are, do you have any thoughts on that? That I mean, was Kate kind of left on its own? Was it abandoned? Uh, you fend for yourself. This is time for the South Vietnamese to step in. Or? Yeah, that's the thing that bothered me about Vietnam. We're there to help the South Vietnamese fight communism. But I think politics had a lot to do with what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. For example, we couldn't fly an American flag on a fire base. If you wanted to fly a flag, you had to fly a Vietnamese flag, South Vietnamese flag. And I think with the abandonment of LZ Kate, I think Captain Albrecht requested support and help from the South Vietnamese military, but they didn't help us. So that really kind of bugged me. We're there to help those people. And I think the South Vietnamese people as a whole, the villagers and the main people, they cared about us helping them, but the politics of it all was a joke. That's just like today. I mean, Vietnam ended in 75. The communists came in and took over. Now it's Ho Chi Minh City. It's just like Iraq now. We left, now Iraq's starting to fall again. I mean, we try to help people and train people and give them all kinds of equipment and money, and then they just go back to where they were. Right. So that's kind of frustrating. Frustrating to help where help really isn't wanted. Right. Yeah. 